Thanks very much, Professor Pineville, as well, for inviting me along. I just want to say, before we start, about the vasovagals. I think a lot of what happens to women is anxiety, and uh, part of, uh, our, we're always trying to, uh, to uh, reduce the anxiety. But uh, one of the things that definitely helps to, if, to have on hand are the little ice packs because they will stop somebody having a vasovagal. And if you can just get an ice pack on the head behind the, behind the, uh, behind the neck, under the arms, that will oftentimes nearly shock the women back and it can be avoided. And you, 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 I know that from colposcopy. And we always have a, a drawer full of them ready to go. And it's just something very simple. So setting up uh, an outpatient hysteroscopy mm -hmm. a diagnostic and treatment service, it can be very challenging. And one of the reasons is probably trying to sell, sell it to everyone around you, even though you might be 100% dedicated to it. So just a little overview. It's estimated that about a quarter of all women will complain of abnormal uterine bleeding at some stage in their lives. And historically, there wasn't a big deal made about it. Most women endured it until the menopause. But things have changed, and now more women are seeking assistance. And that's because we're all out at work. A lot of people are not willing to put up with the tiredness that goes with all of this blood loss. They're also more aware of what's going on, and that's through media and healthcare professionals and their friends and talking about things. That didn't always happen in the past. Women are also aiming to have a healthier lifestyle, and if you're fatigued and exhausted and bleeding, you can't do that. And they're not happy either to stay at home and not be able to leave the house for several days every month. That's just not an option anymore. <clears throat> so why hysteroscopy? Traditionally, we all know that <coughs> DNC was what happened in theater, but with the pels and transvaginal scans, the uh, ability to sample the endometrium and to view it became an option for outpatients. Hysteroscopy then traditionally done in theatre and still being done in theatre constantly here uh, can quite easily be done in the outpatient setting. That allows the visualisation of the endometrial cavity and it remains the gold standard diagnostic tool and the, aim, the principal aim being to identify or exclude endometrial pathology. So with a movement to outpatients, we have to really see why is that of benefit. So the first thing is that there's an awful lot less disruption to the woman's life. She has to visit a clinic for a morning or an afternoon. She can go home, resume normal, normal uh, activities. Theatre is an entirely different situation where it has to be planned, she's going fasting, she has to take time off work to recover. There are also a lot of economic pressures from in the public system at the moment, and uh, we're trying to reduce the cost of all these things, and bringing women into theatre for a simple hysteroscopy seems to be excessive. The devices as well have improved over the years, and it's now, they're much smaller and much more comfortable. And the Department of Health, of course, is trying to uh, get a bigger throughput of patients, and to have a more economical management. So the outpatients, it is suitable for both diagnostic and treatment of many gynae conditions. And the aids for the diagnosis would be your scanning, the clinical examination, which must never be overlooked and is very important, hysteroscopy and then endometrial sampling. And from the treatment point of view, the morena can be inserted, polyps can be excised, or uh, you can do endometrial ablation, and now we have more salation. The disadvantages, a lot of the time, women are very embarrassed, they do not want <coughs> to get into the lithotomy position, so you have to gently, as Walter said, you know, underplay what's going on, but make them aware at the same time that they are having a procedure. There can be, discomfort and pain. I know Walter said it's very <coughs> easy, but he's so experienced. You know, everyone 
isn't there yet and hopefully we'll have more that will be that good and that will be less painful but sometimes the women do complain of a, a period like cramp and uh, one of the big things is uh, I know John Luke says he has nobody to help him and he does it all on his own but it is recommended that there is somebody to talk to the woman and to distract her really while the procedure is on <laughs> you can multitask, you see. That's the good part. And also, the French are probably less likely to sue you uh, as a medical legal phenomenon. Yeah. In Ireland, you have to have a chaperone. Okay. That's a different thing. Yeah. And really, the, uh, the initial work that has been done in England, they recommend a nurse, a nurse to assist, a nurse to circulate, and a, a care assistant to chaperone. That is, you know, we just couldn't do that and we would not get any support for that if we tried to do that here. It would not be possible. But I'm just saying that's the ideal world. Uh, I think we don't usually, mostly people can walk out the door, but very occasionally, and again I think it's a lot of it is through anxiety, we might need a little recovery room or a chair. And I think that is, uh, that's important for the few that need it because you don't want to be holding up the clinic room with somebody recovering on the couch or not being able to, to let them leave the room. And you do, if you're having that, you need to have somebody that can pop in and out to look at them while they're still on the, prom the premises because yes, we do have a, a huge legal obligation to, to try to avoid any, any litigation. And uh, some times, this is maybe not initially, but occasionally it happens initially too, you want to give the woman some bad news and she has to walk out the door and go straight home and I still find that a very, very difficult uh, scenario where we don't have some place where we can let women sit down, have a cup of tea, call their family, bring in somebody. I think that's a real, really lacking in a lot of our services. So the disadvantages for the clinician or the organization is that sometimes cases are difficult uh, and uh, in theater, perhaps you, you, uh, you can be more flexible with what you can do, but I think that can be overcome. The multitasking and the ability to communicate for, for clinicians mm -hmm. is very important. Mm -hmm. and in theater, you don't have to think about talking to the patient, they're asleep, so it doesn't matter. But when you're in the outpatient situation, you, you would need to be able to both do your procedure and talk to the patient at the same time. And I often find that when people are starting to train either in colposcopy or hysteroscopy, and they've been used to doing it in theater, and they come to the outpatients, they find it they're very nervous until they get used to it. And that's just, it is important that we give time to people when they're doing that and try to to ease them through it, because being a good communicator uh, will ease the journey for the woman. And one of the big problems is remuneration, and uh, there's a there's a real need to get the financial departments in the hospital to work with this, and they're quite reluctant because they don't see it as being big money, so they're very reluctant to change the titles of the outpatient rooms and give them codes that would allow us to be able to collect some money for the procedures. So planning hysteroscopy, uh, the Green Top Guidelines say outpatient hysteroscopy, whether diagnostic or operative, is successful, safe, and well tolerated. And that's what we have to remember when we're trying to move from inpatient to uh, the outpatients. But they can be associated with pain, anxiety, and embarrassment, and we want to try to reduce that as much as possible. When we're trying to set up a service, we're trying to move anything, it's very, very important and it's something I always keep at the back of my mind that 80% of people do not like change. So you're constantly on a, climbing a ladder trying to get uh, people to, to buy into what you want to do. So you have to look at this as a business, as everything else, and you need to make a business case. But you're not looking at just the financial aspects of the service. So what are the benefits for the woman? The procedure is safe and effective. 
the woman can be involved in the procedure, therefore she's empowered, and if she's empowered, she will have greater satisfaction from the event. There's a reduced risk of uterine perforation, as we've already discussed. There's no prep for, in, for pre-op, and there's no general anesthetic, and there's no post-op recovery time. There's very little time to be taken off work, and that's important as today's world, we've just had new guidelines again where the, the sick leave and everything is being reduced. So women do not want to spend time off work. You can have a one-stop shop where you can see and treat options if they're appropriate and if they're available. You, the patient will get the results faster. If, you, if a patient comes in, has, has a clinic appointment, then has to be booked for theatre, may have a cancellation, then has her procedure done in theatre and she has to come back to the clinic for her results. You're, you're losing all that middle part. So the most she's got to do is come back for her results and that may be possible to send them to her or to her GP and save her another trip back to the hospital. And by having things done in the outpatients, there is a reduced chance of getting hospital acquired infection if you don't have to be inpatient. Mm -hmm. For the organization, it's a better use of resources. It can free up the theater space for more complex cases. The risk of cancellation is reduced. Staff working in outpatient testoscopy clinics get great satisfaction from the work they do because they see the woman coming in, getting seen, getting dealt with, getting treated, and going home and having the whole, everything sorted in the one day. The, you can also increase your patient through because you can have more people into the clinic and you can get through more procedures. And you can reduce your return appointments. You can also start to use advanced nurse practice and so train some nurses to take over some of the workload in the outpatient setting. And this has been very successful in England. I think they have about 100 nurses who are uh, hysteroscopists now. And it's a possibility of uh, claiming some of the expenses through the hospital inpatient management system. So your aims and objectives. I think it's important that you're clear about what type of service you want to offer. I think um, to do that you need to review your gynae referrals and see how many patients are coming in and being referred to you with abnormal uterine bleeding. And then you would need to look at their age profile you want to know who will run your clinic then. Is it going to be consultant only? Are you going to train a nurse? And the fact that you're going to need a nurse to assist and train and perhaps uh, go on to advanced practice. You also need to get your nurse management bought in to the fact that it's going to be a change the way you're running your clinics. So patient criteria. Do you need the clinic to be for rapid access for postmenopausal bleeders? Is that the kind of clinic or rapid access clinic you're setting up? Or are you mostly uh, presenting with women who have menorrhagia? Or are you going to uh, use it for a mix of everything? There's also, which we haven't really thought about much here yet, the possibility of the need for a walk-in service for women who have bleeding problems. They're currently taking up space in the emergency room, and it's a big problem in our service. But it's a, I think it probably is a little bit <coughs> adventurous to think about that yet. And then you need to think about what guidelines are you going to give to your referral sources. Do you want them to do some investigations before to the clinic or just the first time they see a woman? Or are they going to send her in for her uh, into the clinic? Where are you going to set your clinic up? Are you going to use existing space or do you need to see about getting uh, a new room? Can you convert a gynae session that's already going to an AUB session? That's what we did when we set up our, our system. Uh, or do you need to think about having a whole new time slot, uh, <coughs> which would probably mean a lot more staff needing to be brought on board? The room needs to be adequate size and there needs to be good ventilation because there's a lot of heat created from the machines. One thing that people don't think about is that you actually need a clinic code for setting up your appointments and uh, it seems such a small thing but in our service it always creates 
huge difficulty if we want to change a code on a clinic or if we want to set up a new clinic code. And that's really negotiating with whatever section of the IT department are involved in that. And there's always huge resistance to that. I'm sure she will if she remembers when she, was, when she yeah. came first yeah. time. <laughs> <How'd Yeah. laughs> No, we got rid of you, but uh, I do remember with your clinic code, the change it took ages to get it sorted, but that happens with every single one time I want to do it. Um, you need computer access. Are you going to be able to capture your data on computer? Because that will be a very great benefit for, for your audit mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, the things you want to do for your numbers <coughs> and everything down the road. And what about sharing it with other services? We share one of our rooms with Corposcopy. Uh, there's also the possibility of sharing it with Eurogyne if you have those facilities uh, in your service. Other requirements, you definitely need transvaginal scanning. So is that available locally or do you have to negotiate with the, the x-ray department in some cases or with your, if you're in a charity hospital with, with, this, with your ultrasound department? and consider acquiring our training a nurse stenographer, perhaps if there isn't one already in place. And we're very, very lucky that Professor Prendival managed to get one on site for us some years ago, so she is available always for that clinic. The possibility of bringing the service to the patient, and what I mean by that is if you're setting, setting up, if it's possible that you have, bring the patient into the room, bring be able to bring the sonographer in, do the scan, and then, or do it yourself if you can, and then do the hysteroscopy and uh, whatever treatment you might want to do, rather than the woman have to get into one room for her scan, then change, come out, go to another room. So it's bringing the service to the patient. So your equipment, uh, we have couches that are adjustable, and they are an absolute godsend because uh, with different, everyone's a different size and a different shape and the location of the, of the uterus is slightly different so you can manipulate to your advantage. You need your stacking system, your light source, your camera, you need multiple hysteroscopes of whatever type you decide to use. <coughs> and we have at least eight, we have actually got 10 now I think. And some of them can be diagnostic, some of them are able to take uh, direct biopsies and some of them can do operations procedures. Uh, image capture is always great and I think it's the way, it's an absolute uh, vital part of any service that can be set up at this stage. I don't think it's acceptable not to be able to capture images when you do a uh, hysteroscopy and it's, it's your evidence for what you have seen. Um, the distension media that we use is normal saline, it is messy but it is very comfortable and will help with, with uh, the insertion of the scope and you do need your sterilization facilities that's really really important and when you're setting up a service if you don't already have something in place you have to negotiate with them because it is extra workload for them yeah. <clears throat> and even though they may think that it's just a move over from theater well the theater slot's going to be filled with something else and they'll have to deal with that so this will be extra and they do need to know to buy into being able to help you with it. Uh, the waiting area as well is very important. You can't set up a service without having some place for the patients to wait. They need a changing area and toilet facilities. We have in one of our rooms, because it's, it's the room that's a coposcopy room as well, we have uh, DVDs for the women to watch. We have uh, screens on the ceiling and we also play music for them. You do need resuscitation facilities. You may never need, you may never have to use them and hopefully you won't, but it is a requirement and everybody needs to know where they are. Um, and a recovery room, if it was at all possible, and maybe some place for a woman to be able to have a cup of tea. This is one of our rooms. And this room, we have uh, a TV scanner in it. <coughs> This is, the, this is the one where the, we have the scanner and the stacking system and the couch that can be adjusted. And this one has the, the colposcope <coughs> is there. So oftentimes if a woman comes in with bleeding and you think that there's something wrong with the service, 
that cervix, you can do, uh, quite easy to do a colposcopy if somebody's trained to do that. So we, we quite often uh, end up having to do a colposcopy in the cervix. <coughs> One thing that people shouldn't forget is that you need administrative support, and that can often be uh, make a huge difference to whether the service is ever going to go off the ground properly. But when we're setting up nurse-led clinics, we find that management don't ever think that nurses also need to have that. We still have our, our uh, sonographers having to make their own appointments, and that really takes from the service because it won't run as efficiently and you're not using your staff to their best capacity if they have to end up making their own appointments. So I think it is hugely important and uh, a requirement for all your correspondence and your appointments. So for the staffing of the room, you need a hysteroscopist and like I said, there can be a doctor or a nurse. You need an assistant and if possible, but we don't have it, a healthcare assistant to support the patient and the conversation to distract. That is unbelievably important. You need to have the woman uh, distracted, really, as, as much as possible. And all members of the team must be adequately trained and familiar with the equipment. The surgical procedures, and this is from uh, the Clark and Gupta 2005 book, biopsies, insertion of uh, Morena's polypectomies, myomectomies, aphesiolysis, endometrial destruction, sterilization, and uh, uterine correction, all possible if you have the right facilities. Now I must say, our, our hysteroscopy at the moment is diagnostic, but it would be, uh, and it is something that we hope to advance in the future. The management of the, as, like everything else, clinics need to be managed. You need to set up guidelines and protocols uh, Patient selection is not so important for, for diagnostic hysteroscopy, but it is important if you're doing endometrial ablation that you, that you select your patient because uh, that will give you the result. That if you have someone who is extremely anxious and doesn't really want to have the ablation done in the outpatients <coughs> and you push them towards it, they're going to have ex extreme pain and they're going to feel everything and they're not going to be happy about what happened. Whereas if you have somebody who doesn't want to have a GA and wants everything done, then they will uh, be the successful candidate. Clinical governance is always very important for these clinics, audit and risk management, um, the need for multidisciplinary team meetings. Not done much at the moment, but it's starting to be done in England and some, around some of these clinics and uh, certainly for complex cases it would be, uh, it would be helpful. The clinic itself needs to have regular meetings with all its staff, good communication, for team building, and for solving the problems that occur on a day-to-day -day basis. Far better that you do it through a regular meeting than trying to deal with things on a one-to-one -one <coughs> basis. So your audit and evaluation it should be an ongoing process. It's important for assessing patients' needs. And the one thing about audit is that it's only useful if it's reflected upon if you can evaluate what, the, what your findings were and if you can take action on it and then implement the change and then, of course, re-audit again to make sure everything is working. So it's a continuous process. Risk management, uh, regular risk management to identify potential causes of harm, both to patients and to staff. And these are requirements that we all have to do for everything now. It might be just something like aging equipment making sure you're, that, that uh, your scopes are all in good working order. The management of specimens, making sure new people coming on board are aware of problems with spillages or splashes. And that may be something that people haven't been used to in outpatient settings. And there needs to be ongoing training and it needs to be got, you know, worked on through, through management. So you can carry out a risk assessment, decide what precautions or requirements you would have again the uh, preparation of a risk statement, and then you'd review and update. And again, it's a continuing process. So really, to do all this, you need a business case, and really all of this is just what I've talked about. we are talking about the background, the clinical problem, patient demography, uh, description of your current services, 
then you go to your strategic context, the drivers for change, the objectives, the benefits. You develop your proposal, you describe your options, your preferred options, the reasons for choosing this, both from the patient and the staff and the organization, the details of the proposed development, all the things we've discussed, and even down to your car parking. Uh, you also want to discuss who else you need to, to buy into this. Histopathology, they might have extra specimens coming, are they able to cope with that? And your ultrasound, and the fact that you may have more patients being transferred onto your oncology unit. Financial implications, of course, are what drive all these things, and uh, the fact that the hospital would have the ability to claim some money for it. Your funding options, the different way to do business, it's hopefully a potential saving to the hospital that you would have uh, less people going to theatre for a minor procedure. And then the non-financial aspects, and really it's about improvement in the quality of care that you can give to the patient. And work, a time, work out a timetable, perhaps through a Gantt chart. Uh, and then just about your risk assessments. I just thought I'd tell you about nurses' endoscopy training. At the moment, we have nothing here in Ireland. And I went to Bradford to train at the hospital and the university. And there are currently two nurses from Cork attending that course at the moment. And it's a taught course, and you do an OSC in the book, <coughs> similar to, um, to the colposcopy. And then you can add on a, a marine insertion course or a treatment module. And that, that can all be part of a master's in women's health. And this is just a little bit about the referrals to our clinic from August 2012 to October 2013. And uh, Dr. Suzanne Smith did this for a recent presentation. And we had 36% of our patients were postmenopausal bleeding women. But if you look at this, you'll see we did not get them in within two weeks, so we do not have uh, a good, but it is good by general Ireland standards, but it takes, they had a, over a six week waiting time for that. Um, another 36% came with menorrhagia, but they had to wait over 15 weeks. Intermenstrual bleeders, 17 weeks. Survival, patients that came and that ended up having cervical pathology were 10 and that they had almost seven weeks to wait for appointments. And then there were about 18 others and they had roughly uh, 12 weeks to wait. The findings from this was that 7% of these women with, with postmenopausal bleeding had severe pathology. And 74% of women with postmenopausal bleeding didn't need to go to theater at all. Mm. Uh, Outpatient hysteroscopy was successful in 84% of our postmenopausal bleeders, 86% of our intermenstrual bleeders, and 93% of our patients that came with menorrhagia. So we're not having having, but it's not it's it's comparable to success. With that. So to conclude, outpatient hysteroscopy clinic <coughs> provides a safe, effective, modern approach to the management of women with abnormal uterine bleeding. Thank you.